Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Deep Adaptation Q&A with me, your host, Professor Jen Bendel. And today our guest is Dr. Ye Tao, who's the founder and head of the Mere Reflection Project. So in 2018, he was a Harvard engineer working on nanoscale magnetic resonance imaging. And he read the Deep Adaptation paper on climate disaster, and he was started cross-checking it with other climate science and concluded that climate change really is an existential risk to modern civilization, including everything he was working on at the time. So obviously then he decided, like many of us should do, to stop what he was doing and rethink everything. And he decided to use his expertise to try and give humanity a better chance of reducing the catastrophe ahead. So Dr. Tao has since been developing and promoting what he argues is a cheap, safe, green, and flexible form of climate engineering. So it uses mirrors to reflect the sun. So unlike many other geoengineering ideas many of us would have heard of, it doesn't seem very uh, far-fetched or scary. Um, and he arrived at that idea after analyzing and debunking the science or the economics behind many other approaches in this geoengineering field, uh, which is also known today as climate repair and climate restoration. So we're going to hear about the Mere Reflection project and its proposals and how it's evolved today. I'm interested because when the topic of geoengineering comes up, people often relate to it in perhaps not very diligent ways. They see it as one thing rather than many ideas. And they either like it or dismiss it because of their general attitude towards technology, seeing technology as either uh, sinner or savior. In addition, I think far too many people relate to it in terms of their own professional or commercial interests, and therefore promoting the ideas which offer the best potential return to venture capitalists, the people who are funding them. Now, I think corporations undermined the effectiveness of the decades of climate concern, and we risk them undermining this new era of climate emergency. So I think we really need to look at ideas that are not driven by those interests. Dr. Ye Tao is promoting a plan that is not corporate. It's not going to make billionaires more money. I think the absence of well-paid PR companies is prob probably why you haven't heard much about it before now. So we're going to, I'm really pleased to host Dr. Tao to talk about the challenge we face, talk about how it's inescapable, and to hear about his proposals for lessening the impacts, and that's called mere reflection. Yay, Tao, thank you for joining us this Sunday. How about that, joining on a Sunday? I think that's proof, isn't it, that uh, this isn't just a day job. This is... Um, well, then, <laughs> I guess that's quite normal, you know, for us academics. Okay. Uh, I haven't known a weekend, you know, since uh, entering college, let's say. So it's uh, just another normal day. Okay. <laughs> just good. used I... for a um, different purpose. So Hopefully have... a more meaningful one. Yeah. So no chance of burnout then. This is, this is just how you rock and roll. So why is that? What is motivating you to work so hard um, on this rather than another way of, like so many people are now working on geoengineering or climate restoration in some way, but in ways that have quite a clear um, route to big bucks, to profit. You're really working on something which is non-profit, um, which is super flexible, grassroots, deployable. Why, why are you working on something that's not going to make you rich? What's wrong with you? <laughs> well, I think uh, if one is genuinely interested in trying to solve this problem, one would have realized that continuing the current paradigm, capitalistic exploitation of resources of humans, well, just lead to nowhere. And we are basically on the cusp of you know, societal uh, decay due to um, overuse of resources and the uh, environmental conditions that support life. So uh, concurrent to any uh, technical intervention, we have to undertake social uh, engineering, social changes, let's say, and the transformation of the society to one that uh, values life, values human life equally, and values uh, nature, values... Uh, 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 you know, and it really get rid of this uh, focus on just money and profit in the next quarter. And uh, the timescale of climate change, as we know it, is on the uh, multi-year to decadal timescales. And that's uh, really a mismatch compared to 
the quarterly reports or even the four year election cycles. Mm. So uh, what we can provide as engineers scientists is only you know, technical advice on what's required to maintain the fundamental uh, basic conditions to enable life and to enable human society to, to persist. But we can't really use the technical knowledge alone to inform people about how to restructure uh, our civilization, which is necessary for it to survive past the next decades. What we can do is to help us navigate the coming decades, which will be very difficult from a climate change and natural disaster and extreme weather point of view. Um, but with that uh, vision in mind, we try to design elements that are compatible for such societal transformation uh, in our strategy, uh, in the mirror framework. And uh, that's why uh, I think there is a lot of synergy between uh, different groups like Extinction Rebellion and the gym on uh, uh, the group of gym and many others are working on fighting racism, um, structural inequality, et cetera, and our more technical uh, uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I want to hear more about the specifics of your project, but I think we really need to locate it in uh, a sense of where we're at, because um, what I like about how you approach this is uh, you say it as you see it, whereas so many people who work on climate as scientists, as scholars, um, sort of hedge things and they're very keen to make sure that it doesn't uh, instigate despair or panic or whatever. Uh, but when I've heard you talk and when I've read your writings, you're really clear about we have to see things as, as bad as they truly are in order to then look at what will work, as you say, within the timescales that we're dealing with. So straight off, do you think there is any truth perhaps to a, the, the, a truth in the climate orthodoxy that humanity can stay below two degrees of global ambient warming this century um, if we have the boldest of emission cuts and natural drawdown efforts? And if you don't, then why, why, why are you different to that orthodoxy? Yeah, so uh, I will just be brief here, but today I actually prepared some, a presentation with uh, uh, you know, fresh data enabled by the COVID-19 lockdown measures that uh, gives mm -hmm. a hint as to whether uh, such a measure immediate uh, stop to all emissions could be a way to escape the two degree. And I'd the short like answer is that. it's but, very, but the short very answer. unlikely. It's very unlikely, extremely improbable in scientific terms for mm -hmm. that to happen regardless of emission scenarios. Right. And, and okay. the reason I think uh, many uh, you know, fellow colleagues uh, in the climate fight are trying to uh, take a more uh, reserved approach when uh, giving future prognosis uh, is perhaps they truly believe that's the best way to uh, help decarbonize, which is in itself a very difficult task. So we shouldn't hold it against them, uh, their person for doing that. I think they are sincere in their beliefs, but uh, I personally don't think that's a productive approach because we, uh, we are, would be like insulting people and their intellect by trying to dumb things down and try to uh, present a filtered version of uh, our best understanding of reality. So that's yeah. why I'm more forthcoming in uh, giving my best personal interpretation of available evidence. Yes. So, um, so what do you think of the, uh, the science that's, that some people cite to say that it's not too late to, to stay below two degrees? Maybe you said you, you've pulled together some data. Do you want to, on that topic, do you want to share that with us? Um, yeah, I can um, maybe just now uh, give this presentation, which is um, something really uh, fresh. Nobody has seen it before this presentation. Yeah. All right, so let's just uh, remind us of uh, um, the central question, uh, which might be uh, useful in this debate, is whether um, humans can survive um, in the case of a complete shutdown to the economy and hence all emissions. I think the major question is whether ecosystems and human systems can survive a temperature past two degrees. Because as we will see, um, all indication seems to be that we're basically already past two degrees. So I made this chart um, a, a few years ago now to look at where uh, you know, the ecosystem of Earth is happy in this uh, CO2 concentration and average global temperature diagram. 
and plotting empirical data. Basically, that's what the Earth has been doing. In practice, we can very easily use linear uh, projection to predict where uh, the average temperature will be in a few years in the Cato timescales, because such huge systems, they have a certain inertia and including the human system, such linear projection generally work very well. And this was, was made in 2018, 2019. And if you look at the, uh, the most recent projections using the most complicated climate models, you basically get the same thing. And what I added in addition to just the physical parameters are what the ecologists, uh, biologists have found to be uh, limiting temperatures for uh, different uh, individual species and ecosystems. And there hasn't been any ecosystem that doesn't really suffer greatly, sometimes often going to local extinction when you ramp the temperature up, the average temperature up by two degrees or so. Of course, we know a global average temperature of two degrees doesn't mean that it's a very gentle two degree rise. It's a replete with extreme weather events, sometimes you know several days over 50 or 60 degrees that basically wipes out entire regions as we have seen, um, starting to see in the Western Canada last year. So since making this figure, there has been several uh, publications coming out, confirming essentially the uh, trajectory we're on would be more or less independent of uh, emission scenario. And we will see data from COVID-19 that confirms or gives a credence to this uh, model prediction. So first thing first, some people were very happy that um, uh, COVID-19 led to a 7% reduction in CO2 emissions during that year. So uh, a bunch of scientists asked the question, would such a signal be detectable in the long-term climate trend, um, for example, in the Keeling curve? And the answer is no. You would need something like four times the COVID lockdown emission reduction to, for the signal to be barely emerging out of uh, background uh, variability. And on the other hand, 2020 uh, was a year with a lot of uh, natural disasters. And Actually, many records were set, including a record number of named storms in the Atlantic, and uh, also the wettest August in India and Pakistan, uh, and the wettest rainy season in China since uh, about uh, 60 years, just to name a few. So many scientists start to ask the question whether there could be any link, causal mechanistic link between uh, lockdown measures and extreme weather events. So before answering that question, I want to uh, very briefly review how energy flows in the system and why such interactions can lead to uh, extreme weather events. Everything on Earth's surface and the bi biosphere were driven by sunlight. That's the ultimate source of energy and hopefully also of a renewable energy for human civilization. At the surface, most of this light is converted into heat. And the heat exists in different forms two of which include um, an increase in surface temperature, whether it's ocean heat content, water temperature, or it's a soil temperature. The other way in which heat can manifest itself is through the evaporation of water. When water evaporates, it, uh, has a, a phase it undergoes a phase transition, which um, can take away some of the heat. And this in general has a cooling effect. So making the sensible heat less. And Imagine that you have some hot air in above some land. This air would be less dense, just like a hot air balloon. So it tends to rise. And the way it rises, it also in, uh, induces circulation in the atmosphere, i.e. air movement. Now, when you have uh, the movement of wet air, that's how water gets transported from the oceans to land and eventually becomes rain and flood. So here is basically the causal chain that we need to keep in the back of our mind as we uh, try to understand the data that emerged from COVID. At the very beginning of the pandemic, uh, uh, a group of scientists, uh, interdisciplinary, got together and wrote this um, paper in one of the first editions of Nature Review, Earth Environment. And they foresaw that this event of lockdown would enable us to probe many interconnected systems uh, on Earth. Uh, and today, of course, due to time constraints, we'll not go into how agriculture and wildlife are affected, but instead we'll just look at the very core uh, over here, how emissions of both greenhouse gases and of pollution impact temperature, which would then be a primary driver for weather events, production of uh, crops, et cetera, et cetera. So we're looking at this uh, more upstream 
uh, part of the equation. And many people uh, may not have heard that when you uh, burn fossil fuel, you emit uh, not only CO2, uh, which is warming, but also aero uh, organic carbon and other uh, nitrogen oxide that participate in making particles that cool the earth, that has a cooling impact. So here we'll just uh, call it pollution, uh, according to what those uh, people uh, did on, in this review. And uh, the direction of these arrows represents either a heating impact or a cooling impact. A very uh, important difference between these two uh, components is that the heating impact or heating components like CO2 or nitrous oxide, especially, are very long lived. So their lifetimes are above one century, sometimes uh, up to uh, 10,000 years in the case of CO2. The cooling emissions, like air pollution, they are washed away in any weather events, so they live for days. So when society is operating normally, you have both components um, uh, you know, present. <clears throat> this uh, slow component uh, grows very slowly, whereas this cooling component is more or less held constant. So when you add these two vectors or these uh, numbers together, one positive, one negative, you get a net uh, forcing or net heating, which is less than what would have been when there's no more air pollution. Uh, so in the hypothetical case of 100% renewables, you would end up with a uh, power driving global warming, which is larger than what we would be experiencing right now. So COVID-19 didn't go to this extreme. What happened was that uh, the arrow pointing down got smaller by anywhere between a quarter to half, depending on location, for a duration of from uh, a couple months to sometimes a half a year. So we have on the order of, let's say, uh, back of envelope uh, estimate, a third of the emission that's uh, reduced over a, the period of a, a few months. So this provides a sort of a controlled experiment to probe how the Earth system, the climate system responds to this sudden change. Before we uh, go assess uh, the key number, which is, uh, you know, the cause for a lot of uh, debate, is basically the magnitude of this cooling impact. And um, after COVID, uh, the newest, the most recent assessment points to a power, cooling power of 1.2 watts per meter squared with some um, uncertainty from different types of, of estimates. So remember that number. It's a, uh, these are very simple numbers. They're basically one. <laughs> So uh, our best estimate is one watt per meter squared. So the other piece of the puzzle uh, to understand how much warming is in the pipeline is a factor that allows you to convert this weird quantity or this weird unit of uh, power per meter squared to a degree simple. So this number uh, is called climate sensitivity and it, it has a unit of degree per watt per meter squared. Uh, the reason, uh, for example, if you're doing dimensional analysis, it's clear that when you multiply these two numbers together, uh, the watt per meter squared cancel, and you're left with uh, the, a degree. That's basically how much heating would be uh, hidden based on our best estimate. Now let's look at uh, uh, data enabled by COVID-19. First question, did we experience more sunlight coming down to the ground? So these are uh, measurements taken in India, a place that's really uh, polluted. And uh, <clears throat> lockdown uh, occurred sometimes during March. And we see that uh, compared to the previous three years in February, the data from um, 2020 was more or less uh, on top of the average. But after uh, the onset of lockdowns, there was a clear increase in the amount of uh, sunlight reaching the ground in Delhi. In terms of uh, percentage, during the month of uh, March, um, the engineers measured uh, almost on the order of 10% increase in the amount of sunlight. And in uh, power terms, that translates into uh, on the order of 20 watt per meter squared, which is quite uh, substantial compared to uh, the order one watt per meter squared uh, averaged uh, globally hidden um, 
uh, heating power that we mentioned before. Um, two other locations, uh, one is uh, IIT in Kanpur. They measured a dramatic reduction in pollution, PM 2.5, over the lockdown period compared to uh, outside of that window. <clears throat> and uh, this reduced uh, pollution also translated into less cooling by the aerosols. And averaged over the period, uh, over this site, it gave on the order of, again, 10 watt per meter squared of increasing how much sunlight gets converted into uh, or is uh, impingent on the soil during the lock lockdown period. Um, similar results uh, in uh, East China Sea, including some uh, uh, on land. Um, but this is measured at the top of the atmosphere, 1.3. So at the bottom of atmosphere, it would be roughly twice that. So a uh, single digit watt per meter squared increase in how much sunlight is reaching the Earth. So in the interest of time, I will skip through, but the result is basically replicated also in Europe. Uh, for example, Netherlands recorded a very a huge uh, and record increase in uh, solar radiation reaching Earth compared to the past century. So basically, experimental evidence suggests that we have anywhere between one to 10 watt per meter squared increase in short wave forcing. Of course, that's not uh, the energy balance because uh, as land gets warmer, it also radiates more infrared. So the actual total forcing is somewhere less, but it's certainly within the same order of magnitude as estimates of one watt per meter squared of heat, a hidden warming power. Now let's look at uh, whether the land responded to this increased heating power, whether there's any temperature change. Um, the top panel are experimental data or observational data comparing 2020 results to the past 20 years of climate, uh, climate record. So one thing to note is that in these uh, experimental uh, observations, there is a uh, effect in addition to the effect they are trying to isolate, there's also climate variability. For example, this uh, uh, gigantic heating anomaly in April. But comparing the pattern that's emerged um, from the actual observational data analysis with the model analysis, we see that regions uh, centered around Beijing and Wuhan <coughs> seems to be showing consistent uh, anomaly in both model and data. And um, the magnitude is on the order of half a degree Celsius. And that happened basically instantaneously uh, within days to weeks of uh, lockdown measures. Um, more recent measurement uh, confirm that um, this one found a slightly less, but same order of magnitude. And another even more recent study um, <laughs> suggests that there's up to one degree Celsius warming. Um, in this case, I want to explain um, these two figures. Over here is how much sunlight is reaching, how much more sunlight is reaching Earth. And as we will see, you know, the largest uh, warming in this case didn't happen where there was the most sunlight for uh, multiple reasons. One of which the authors uh, suggest is due to the movement, movement of wind and air. So the warming drove um, atmospheric circulations, uh, bringing a lot of the hot air parallel up north from where they were warmed up to where they were sensed, let's say. So you already can appreciate that uh, uh, it's a quite challenging task to really have precise warming numbers uh, due to very uh, large uh, climatic var variability uh, from year to year, from day to day. And different models, different groups get different numbers based on different uh, uh, computational models and the, the measurement data sets they use. So the best that we can glean from climate science at this point is more or less an order of magnitude, maybe uh, a factor plus minus two factor, uh, fudge factor. But overall, um, we have more or less agreements <laughs> that uh, regionally, at least, where um, lockdown was most uh, instantly implemented and gave a very sharp uh, driving signal, we have on the order of half a degree increase in surface temperature. 
And uh, also that if you, we had time to look through all the data and all mm -hmm. the papers, you would notice that observational perturbations generally uh, you know, is larger than what uh, models predict by roughly two to uh, a factor of two to four. And that's something to take into account when you read IPCC papers, projections, which are mostly based on models. And since many of the, uh, the fundamental underlying factors are not clear and they're not yet known because there hasn't been many enough COVID-19 like experiments to pin down these numbers. Uh, that's where, why it's still possible for people with a certain uh, policy objective to really stay on the lower end of uh, these projections. Yeah. That's really, really helpful. Is there anything else you wanted to say about this data? Because otherwise I've got a couple of questions and if you, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, I think we are, we, uh, are you know, halfway through the review of the COVID-19 data and it's a good point for, for questions. What will uh, the next okay. segment, if we have time, would be about uh, uh, examples of extreme weather events driven by this initial temperature rise. So I think, well, yeah, you've 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 talked about those extreme weather events at the start, and so you'll be looking at the data that suggests there's connection. Thank you, mm -hmm. thank you, Dr. Tao. So what I've got from that is um, a reminder using a observational data, data right now of the what's called global dimming and therefore the horrible conundrum we have as, as we uh, get off fossil fuels, uh, as we electrify and decarbonize, where we'll actually see this short-term heating pulse. And therefore, um, it, it's, it's kind of like this, um, the whole agenda of emission cuts, of eco-modernity, of a Green New Deal. It's based on a, it's based on such a blind spot, such an ignoring of this reality that you've just talked about, that um, it's not credible, it's not serious. It's, 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 it's quite amazing, really. Also, I mean, you, you mentioned also about how, yeah, because models, models have many limitations, computer models of climate. And that if we actually look either at observational data or if we look at the paleo record, it tells us that, hey, we are set for a certain amount of heating. And therefore, you're right. It does seem that the people who want to say that we can avoid catastrophic damage to societies, we can reform, we can transition, uh, they want to stick with all the models because then you can just be debating forever about about models, what they say, and what the limitations are. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. Um, for me, I've got enough from what you've presented, yay, to then say, wow, we have to have immediate action now on solar radiation management. Uh, we have to do something as we lose the, the global dimming effects of dirty fossil fuels being burned. That is the stark message from the observational data you presented from what's happened since the lockdowns since uh, early 2020. That's, that's a huge message. It's a huge, it should be huge global news. I can't understand why any credible climate scientist wouldn't have this front and center, let alone a policymaker. So for me, I feel like it's um, also, if you were saying that there's a lot of data to show this led to disasters and people dying and people's lives being ru ruined and economies being trashed, you can't be serious about climate justice without getting serious about immediate measures for solar radiation management. The question then becomes what's doable, what's practical, um, what's not risky, what's accountable to the people affected and so on. So for me, I, I think it's a perfect time to hear what is your proposal for solar radiation management? I, 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 would, I would like to hear about the MIR project and why it makes sense if, you, if we go straight into that. Okay, so before that, I'd like to show one more slide of right. uh, Essence. Uh, sort of, uh, you know, actually very, uh, very relevant to your, your comment and your, your question. So um, a group in Germany um, um, asked the question of, okay, let's say, okay, 
imagine COVID-19 provides this opportunity to start finally the decarbonization project. Let's say we uh, moderately decarbonize by uh, 2050 in some sort of moderate green recovery. What would happen to um, the heating pattern uh, on Earth? Actually, the main result is that there seems to be huge spatial heterogeneity of uh, which countries will uh, be receiving this extra heating power. And uh, um, it just turns out again, it's cert well, we shouldn't be surprised. It's the global South. And that perhaps uh, it's not being talked about because the people most impacted are not likely uh, to be from these regions. So that's just adds another dimension to uh, the process of decarbonizing. And it makes it um, even more important um, to really have a method to shield uh, these populations from the impact of the decarbonization process it, itself. Um, yes, thank you for that. And is that something you've talked about before or is that that's just really become stark because of the uh, lockdown data? Uh, well, uh, that particular uh, figure, that, that's a paper from last year. Uh, mm -hmm. So I haven't really uh, talked about that uh, or shared that with other people. It, it's, it's not our work. I just want to make sure. I mean, so, um, yeah, I mean, equitable responses to the climate disaster and emergency uh, including recognizing who created the problem and who didn't, uh, and who's already living in the on the margins uh, and vulnerable, um, is is incredibly important. The climate justice agenda. So um, yeah, it's thank you for making that so clear for us. And I'm going to be trying to make that known by various people who work in climate activism and climate science and climate policy through the scholar's warning and, and other methods. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, so basically, yeah. let's talk about uh, our project. Yeah, um, tell us what can be done that makes sense rather than millions of pounds and dollars. Uh, great. So um, the basic idea is to intervene at the very first box of that flow diagram that you saw. Basically, how much heat gets absorbed by the earth then, which then drives uh, downstream consequences that include um, um, extreme heat events and uh, extreme uh, weather circulations. So uh, we think the safest way is to do that at the ground level, because then you're not introducing unknown nanoparticles or particles into the atmosphere, the uh, atmospheric chemistry of which is far from being fully understood, unlike what uh, uh, people working on such methods are, uh, are claiming. Um, and I'm happy to point people to references uh, of uh, why there are many open questions and how like ozone problem, for example, could be made worse if it were to go by the atmospheric intervention route. So we believe that it's safest to do it at surface. It's also cheap, uh, for example, compared to launching mirrors into space because a launching cost and fuel emissions would be more than you know, offset some of a lot of the benefits. And when they're uh, simple, close to the ground, um, humans, individual people, and uh, uh, permacultural communities also can maintain and move uh, the mirrors and modify them as they need for local applications. So if somehow uh, ground-based solar radiation management could be put into the hands of people um, and to provide a very strong local benefit, then it uh, provides a natural democratic way uh, for a potential scale uh, at the global scale. And it also provides a way to more or less very evenly distribute out the um, replacement of uh, the pollution uh, because uh, people basically occupy every corner of the, the globe. And if everybody is contributing to this to bring out some local benefit uh, utility, then it's one way to make sure that uh, the cooling is uniform. Um, so we uh, think there are several strategies to, uh, towards um, testing their local benefits and achieving scalability. One is, as you saw in the figure that I just showed, impact of extreme heat will be most severe in parts of India, uh, the Middle East, and also Southeast Asia. So our team were uh, currently working with uh, several um, newly instituted heat officers in uh, Africa and also in India to help communities uh, that are already suffering from extreme heat events uh, right now uh, to have a more uh, uh, better quality of life. Uh, if we could just replace their uh, roof 
uh, with um, combinations of um, mirrored tiles or a flective, uh, flexible mirror sheeting, or even just in some cases, white paint. We can really have an immediate local impact for many people. Um, not to mention the global cooling impact that such um, humanitarian efforts would also bring. So that's one uh, low hanging fruit uh, that we believe should be done regardless of whether uh, the mirror framework eventually scales globally. The other location that we think could be useful is to couple um, mirrors to uh, agriculture, especially regions that are becoming too dry and too hot to sustain crop uh, growth. As we mentioned before, when the heat gets generated on the ground, it leads to temperature increase and also evaporation. Um, so if we can you know, combat both um, consequences by covering up, say, only 10, 20% of the crop plant, in many locations, you can actually boost yield and save water and perhaps even create mm -hmm. new uh, arable land in regions that were previously just too hot and too dry. So, and um, we calculated that between uh, roughly like 10 to 15% of global cropland protected slowly linearly by the end of the century would more or less enable us to maintain current 2020, uh, 20, 20th um, climate. <laughs> so I'd like to pause there to, for some questions about the initial. Yeah, ideas. I, I just want to comment on, on what you said, because yeah, what was really frightening to me from the IPC's most recent report from working group two was that no matter which emission scenario happens, by 2050, hundreds of millions of people around the world are going to be living in places where they risk wet, so-called wet bulb temperature events, where heat and humidity means that we simply can't cope. We die within about six hours, unless we manage to find aircon. <laughs> what, what are any emission scenario? So absolutely, this raises questions that the, the, the mean we have to have serious attention to what you're what you're talking about, what you're what you're doing. Um, and rather than just look at big global efforts, or actually specifically what can be done in the areas that are going to be most effective. So it's um it's an interesting one because for me it kind of challenges this division between mitigation and adaptation. It seems to be both. I I do want to ask though, um Always the problem with any great idea is, is when you look at the detail, the life cycle analysis. So I have to ask you about that, like, and not just the production process, but the distribution of it and the maintenance of it and so on. Because so many clever ideas, when you actually look at it, you look at the energetics, as you did for all the other various different ideas, and you thought, oh dear, these don't actually work out very well. Could you say something about the, pro pro the, the various different ways of reflecting solar radiation that you've you've looked into and, and whether it does make sense to say, for example, produce mirrors and distribute them at such massive scale. Yeah, that's uh, basically the first question that uh, I looked at uh, mm -hmm. when uh, this idea came to mind. It's basically how much energy, how much equivalent CO2 emissions you would actually incur by making these things. So the, the, the answer to that question depends on uh, what technology we use for making the mirrors. Let's just say we just go out there today and pump them out from factories using powered by fossil fuels and natural gas. So uh, calculations show that uh, the amount of CO2 warming that's offset uh, is 10 times the amount of uh, CO2 emitted during the fabrication, distribution, and implementation of the mirrors. So it uh, has a 10 time uh, amplification effect in terms of cancellation. Have you, been, have you been able to get anyone to sort of peer review that and, and, and back that up? Uh, it's been uh, reviewed uh, in email exchanges with uh, fellow in engineers and uh, mm -hmm. uh, people working on uh, similar reflectors. We really uh, need to get your stuff so well known <laughs> that we then we then it's it's the subject of of journals, and so people are really really putting their their efforts to it to reassure. And this is the problem, isn't it? Is to get this idea known. As I said at the start, we don't have PR agencies working for billionaires and venture capitalists trying to promote what you're doing in the same way that they are, say, trying to promote direct air capture of carbon and 
various other schemes which offer potential for returns to investors. Um, how are you going to get this known? How are you going to get it funded? How are you going to get it validated? That was my question. I mean, in the, in the sense it needs to be known and there needs to be resources for people to validate it and therefore to take it to the next level yeah. to get it really then embedded into policies and, 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 and to release budgets from governments and uh, big foundations. There's even a role for billionaires. If any billionaires are watching, can you just put your ego aside, please, and put your designs to try and get richer aside, please, and give half a bill to Dr. Tao right now. Okay, back to you, Dr. Tao. Uh, how are you funding all this? Well, how are we going to get this to, to happen? Uh, yeah, so, so right now we haven't been really focused on uh, fundraising uh, mm -hmm. because we're sort of still lucky that we have enough initial funding from previous uh, sources to... Uh, um, you know, continue a major field experiments plan. Yeah, wrong, wrong, wrong answer. You needed to say we desperately need money right tomorrow. No, but I'm glad to hear you. You're, yeah, so you're you're doing the research phase, and 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 did you say yeah. field trials? Yeah, so I actually can show some uh, initial uh, data from last year, but those were very small field experiments that are mm -hmm. already very very encouraging, showing soil cooling at the surface up up to ten degrees. Celsius, even in um, New Hampshire, which doesn't get too much sunlight. But anyway, so if, if you would only show a slide for three minutes max, then yes, please. But I still want to be able to go to get questions from people. Could if you say you want to share that data? Um, uh, okay, it's yeah. So hand. it's probably better. You guys see it? There we go. So Super. we did a very mini experiment last year uh, using just two mirrors in the field, and uh, it was carried out at uh, Plymouth State, led by uh, PIs uh, that you see here. And we also had another experiment looking at how um, a mirrors uh, floating on water can be used to both decrease evaporation loss, for example, in reservoirs and streams, and also reduce the temperature of the water. So these are, uh, we'll just take a couple of minutes to show. Here are the impact on soil temperature, this time measured at 10 centimeter depth rather than at surface. And even at this depth where the roots are, you can measure significant cooling, in some cases reaching up to uh, five degree. Celsius, uh, and that's very substantial, especially when you're above like 35 degrees, then every fraction of a degree count towards your harvest. In the case of water, you get very similar uh, uh, results. Um, this case, the uh, anomalies, basically cooling are more sinusoidal, which reflects the fact that uh, water has a higher heat capacity. So it doesn't respond as quickly as uh, soil does to solar drive, which can be um, more instantaneous. So I will stop there, and uh, because I think for yeah, this is great. This is great. You're reminding me of my favorite science teachers, <laughs> like who, who like every everything's testable, and we can go out and do experiments, and it's like it make it makes life seem magical. It's it's horrible how science has sort of desacralized, and and made 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 life less magic. When actually actually it can make it more magic. It's like wow, look at look at look at how the world works. So um, I want to go to Terry Rankin, who's, uh, he, uh, who's got a question for you. And it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating question because it's, it's stepping back and looking at the broader environmental crisis of which climate is part. Terry, can you set, uh, switch on your video and, and ask your question? My question comes to this, however. Richard Heinberg, William Reese, and others note that, quote, climate change is not our biggest problem. Overshoot is. Global warming is but a symptom of an ecological overshoot. So the question becomes, how does the mere reflection framework not exacerbate and extend the overshoot? In other words, how does it ultimately make things worse? How does it not, sorry, ultimately make things worse for the larger body of life in the not too distant future? And if I may, to put that differently, it seems your data confirm the paradox of the greenhouse gas blanket effect versus the umbrella effect of aerosol masking. How does the mere framework bring about what might be thought of as the Goldilocks zone balance that would resolve that paradox? Excellent question. So um, the second question is how we uh, would try to balance that. I think that uh, uh, really depends on the scale of the implementation. If it's really at global scale, then there is a, a hope to really uh, rebalance at the planetary scale. But even locally, it's an open question whether whether it's possible to create local habitats uh, using uh, high density of mirrors while the larger uh, global ecological system goes down the drain. 
it is, it's an open scientific question, not one that we want to really you know, see happen. Um, so that's to answer the, uh, the energy balancing or replacing the umbrella part. The first question about uh, uh, whether it will actually exacerbate, uh, you know, just prolong or delay this, uh, this de uh, collapse, let's say, uh, by using mirrors. I think at this point, it's quite clear that society is already collapsing. Uh, if we look around and where uh, it's more and more difficult to move around and uh, we're building barriers, uh, I think, I don't know the latest statistics, but uh, countries in Europe and uh, the Americas are investing maybe twice or many more times more money into building walls and border patrols and <laughs> weaponry rather than to um, you know, help the, the global south. So uh, it's already on a downward trajectory. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But then the, let's step back a, a, a second. Uh, all civilizations eventually collapse. And if you look at as a scientific question, the most optimal duration or lifetime for civilizations is 230 years on a log normal distribution. And there's basically no civilization that has survived past a few thousand years. So why would this one be different? So let's just assume that all civilizations end and this one is coming to an end. Then what's the meaning of uh, life or what meaning of humanity? Um, well, anybody, uh, people have different answers. At Mir, I think at least my personal uh, opinion is that there's a value in uh, making the life of people better. Every individual person counts. Uh, in the end, it's uh, the integration of our collective experience uh, as sentient beings on this planet, not only humans, maybe also animals. So in that, from that perspective, there's no loss. Right? Every family you help in India, every uh, kid that you provide food to, uh, as the society you know, declines uh, mm. inevitably, is a win. So it's a huge opportunity. We see this as an opportunity. Rather than yeah, um, I just want to come in there because you've you've said something which is really important because um, many people seem to think that we only do stuff because we think it will make things better forever. <laughs> the ideology of progress, and also many people assume that anyone who's excited by science and technology somehow is wedded to that paradigm of progress. And therefore, you do what you do because you think it goes on forever. What you have just shown is that actually you can bring all your talents, all your passion for science and technology without being wedded to the ideology of perpetual progress forever. It's about how do we make the best and make life as beautiful and, and as free of suffering as possible for as long as possible for humans and also then try and uh, reduce uh, the nastiness that we've what we've done to the rest of life on Earth. Um, it's actually said that way, just pretty straightforward and obvious. But it's almost like we, we have these ideological blinkers in a, in a progress-obsessed culture. So thank you very much for, for making that point. Thank you for the question, Terry. Um, we've got a question from uh, Patra from XR, which I will ask for her first before going to Arthur. So the question is, uh, is it possible? Are we going to be able to see solar-powered furnaces to produce mirrors one day? Um, and just, just try to... Because a lot of the people who... Uh, uh, sort of are the ma the maximum doomists, shall we say? Say no, none of this is going to work without fossil fuels. In the end, we just it just doesn't work. And so, if you could if you could address that question before we then move to Arthur. Mm. Uh, thank you for the question. That's an excellent one, and uh, uh, actually one that I wanted to address before. So actually, it's already been demonstrated uh, at uh, the Paul Scherer Institute in in Switzerland that it. It's indeed possible to melt glass using solar energy. Uh, but unfortunately, that's for some reason, unknown reason, that group's uh, funding got pulled uh, back in, I think, 2017 or 2018. So that research has just been stopped. You but conspiracy it's, it's theorist, you. Ban this man from YouTube. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, we moved down. We need to. I'll put, I'll, let's find that institute and that project online and I'll put it in the YouTube notes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's, so it's uh, the PSI. It's very famous. I actually was there okay. during my ah. PhD for for some uh, random experiments. Okay. So um, can we go to Arthur for your question? I actually have two questions. The first is, have you looked at the potential impacts of the reflected radiation, for instance, on birds and flying insects or aircraft or something like that? Because sometimes these are sort of you know, you're, you're disturbing other things than 
than just the movement of energy. The second question, because I'm basically a coral reef ecologist, and corals not only absorb sunlight for the other thing, they also reflect it back again in from underneath. Could we design solar panels that would both generate electricity but also have a mirror backing that would be even more efficient because they'd be using solar in both directions and reflect the sunlight back into space. And that would give a double in incentive to be installing both you know, renewable energy generation and you know, reducing solar energy at the surface. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Excellent questions. Again, I love this audience. Um, so the first part about impact to, uh, to birds, et cetera. I think the major reason why people are afraid of such things is because of reports of a concentrating solar power plant killing birds because they purposefully focus the light to a very small volume. And that volume is some, sometimes invisible to the birds. So they fly through and get burned without knowing it. When you just uh, randomly place mirrors uh, in, in the more or less random in a pointing in a general direction, there's essentially zero probability for any focal sp spot to come into being. And when you do not have such high concentration of solar flux, then it's not really possible to really make any damage to birds. Uh, some people are worried about the visual distraction, but in actual implementations, we're looking at on the order of only maybe five to 10% uh, aerial coverage, which basically means that you boost the local albedo by you know, roughly 0 0.1, uh, which from a distance wouldn't really uh, make that much of a difference, especially when um, birds and planes are moving at high speeds compared to the uh, size of a single mirror device. So they wouldn't even see uh, a glaring sun. It's just like tiny uh, clips of photon that merge together to give an overall you know, appearance. And the fact that it has no impact on airplanes um, is uh, demonstrating the fact that uh, our field experiments has been approved to take place right beside an airport. I am dismayed when I look at this broader field of um, used to be called geoengineering, now it's called climate repair and or climate restoration. Um, some nice rebranding there. Um, I see the biggest news, the biggest thing is uh, direct air capture of carbon. Um, and I wondered if you could uh, mention something on that, because people who then get desperate, understandably, and despairing about the situation, and who believe in technology, and we've seen how exciting it can be um, in this past hour, they then hear that, well, hey, these, these machines will save us. Could you say something on that? Because I want to, as we draw to a close, I think it's important that we, yeah, that we we, we, we clarify what our message is for the people who want to work in this field of, of, of climate restoration. Where should yeah. they really put their money and attention and their skills, including young people with, with all their skills, mm -hmm. passion to have a good career? And in, 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 yeah, I think uh, I will give a very useful rule of thumb for the audience. Uh, so in this society, um, energy and money can sometimes be synonymous. So is GDP. So there's a very simple conversion between more or less CO2 emissions and dollar amounts. So you just need to remember that for every uh, ton of CO2 that you emit, the fossil fuel energy costed $50 roughly. So for every ton of CO2. So basically, if you want to have an efficient process of capturing back um, CO2 or offsetting CO2, the uh, dollar amount per ton offset needs to be substantially less than 50. So let's say something like, you know, under 10, then we're talking. If something costs, for example, 1,000 or 500, as is currently the case for direct air capture, you know that these firms are investing more resources, more energy, and more inducing more equivalent CO2 emissions than the amount, the meager amount that they're capturing back. So that's a very easy rule, rule of thumb. But the underlying physical limitation, hard physics limitation, which makes direct air capture infeasible, there are two. One is they're trying to demix an air, which is uh, you know, very dilute. And uh, demixing things is fighting against uh, nature's tendencies to become disordered and mixed up. And there is some minimal energy required. And that energy amount is roughly the same as what humanity uses 
in a single year. That doesn't sound too bad, except when you're, you realize that, say, the airline industry is only like 1% roughly of the global economy. So that's one thing. And uh, efficiency uh, is never you know, 100%. Maybe it's 5%, 10%, which means we need to spend, in the most ideal case, a few decades of all of our energy into performing direct air capture to make a difference. But of course, in the engineering case, you can say, uh, safely you know, multiply that by another factor of mm -hmm. five to 10. So we're talking about century scale, just from the energy limitation point of view. Mm -hmm. The other aspect is uh, kinetics, basically uh, the speed at which you can capture. Uh, so we um, have you know, done a pretty thorough analysis of every single carbon capture method that's uh, publicly out there, including nature-based solutions on land and in the ocean. Another general good rule of thumb is none of these can be scaled to more than or to one gigaton carbon di dioxide per year. And we are emitting equivalents of 50 gigaton carbon per year just from the current economy. So unless we had uh, you know, 50 of such solutions each of which gets total global attention and gets scaling to all over the world, over the whole surface, we wouldn't even be able to offset our concurrent, uh, contemporary emissions. So the speed is another major limitation. Yeah, so current. direct air capture machines are a fertile fallacy if you're an entrepreneur and they're not gonna deliver what we need. And what a shame, we do not have any time to waste. You know, corporates uh, mustn't mustn't distract us. Billionaires mustn't distract us um, from what we really need to do and where the money and resources and the policies need to be to use technology to try and make things less bad. So, um, so yeah, I would say that surely is the message to anyone who's working in climate restoration: quit the bullshit even if you're paid to put it out into the world and start working with people who really, really are trying to do something to reduce the difficult, terrible, horrible situation that modern humans and our capitalist system has got us into. Thank you for what you're doing, Yay. Do yeah. try and take a Sunday off sometimes. What have you said? You haven't had a weekend ever or for years. Do, do, do go and... Don't That's know. a bit of an exaggeration, but uh, the general idea is that I, I don't take it very seriously. <laughs> but, yeah, okay. Well, um, you've, you've done some great work today. I'm looking forward to getting this video out into the world. And um, is there one thing that you can tell us to do, um, either those of us on the call now or who watch this on YouTube, what can we do to help this? How can we be your own, you know, pretend we were your marketing agency, what can we do to help bring attention to what you're doing? Um, I guess just to, really to learn the science and become proficient at explaining it in simple terms. And we're always looking for uh, people who can help us spread the message and just uh, essentially, it's open the information out there. It's just, we need people to be able to translate into a language that people can understand. Uh, mm. That's one thing, uh, but, uh, the more important aspect, I think, is uh, working on the psychological and spiritual component as uh, Jim and many others, including Professor Guy McPherson, whom I respect a lot, have been uh, teaching. Uh, I think it, in the end, it's a spiritual journey and um, we cannot you know, really be optimal unless we have gone through the, that process. So I guess uh, it's back to, to, uh, to your work, Jim. Yeah, thank you for mentioning the whole deep adaptation idea, turning into the really, the turning towards just how bad it is and letting that, um, letting that hurt, letting that um, challenge everything we told ourselves about the future and, and, our, and our own place in the world. And then trusting what, trusting something useful will emerge, you know? I mean, unless you allow the despair and the pain, you don't, don't know what's after that. And um, we've been all quite upbeat today, and that might give the impression that there hasn't been all that, 
all that pain and shock and oh my god what are we going to do but um but it's also showing that there's a there's almost like a post doom post despair way of being which is like okay it's shit now what do we do so thank you for embodying that wonderfully for us today thanks for everyone for joining and um i hope to see you at the next deep adaptation q a